I'm Kevin Lawson, professional engineer. I've spent a lot of time designing HVAC systems. Uh, recently left to found Ripple, um, working on increasing engineering productivity. One way to do that is AI. Not the only way, maybe not the best way, but it's a way. So I've investigated it a lot, and I'd kind of like to talk to you about how it's going to work its way into our industry. Um, so here are the learning objectives that we went over. I'm going to focus on the, the first two in just real broad strokes. Um, so outline, we're going to talk about what is AI, what is supervised machine learning, what are large language models, how can we use them in HVAC design, uh, can we build a large language model for HVAC design, and if we can't, how can we use AI in HVAC design, and then we're going to go over three real-world examples of using AI and HVAC design that you can use today. Uh, but first, I'd kind of like to get a feeling for the audience. How many uh, contractors do we have in the audience? Builders, design-build contractors? Okay. How about uh, design engineers, consulting engineers? Okay. Uh, how about uh, equipment manufacturers? Okay. Okay. Did I, did I miss anybody? Okay. Uh, so what, what is AI? So AI takes input data, gives you an output. If that output is like what a human would do, we call it AI. Uh, now there's a, lots of different ways to, to do this. Uh, as, as Christian went over, symbolic artificial intelligence and expert systems, it could be something as simple as a flowchart. Now this may seem simplistic, but once you digitize thousands of decisions, the results seem miraculous. Uh, Christian went over doctors using mycin to um, detect uh, blood infections. Pilots use these checklists and it reduces crack, uh, airplane fat fatalities. It's just a great system. And if you're looking to implement AI in your design practices, I would start by expert system, flowcharts, write your procedure. That's a great place to start. It's not new and fancy, but I think it's the most practical, practical application. If you need new and fancy, you have to go to machine learning. So there's two flavors of machine learning, supervised machine learning and unsupervised machine learning. So supervised machine learning, this is what ChatGPT is, this is what large language models are. These assume you have some output that you're looking for, some training data that you can train your model on. This is the output I want, I need to train this given the input. Uh, you also have unsupervised machine learning. So this is uh, just, data processing. So this is data from Old Faithful in Yellowstone. This is the delay between eruptions, the duration of eruption. Any person can see that we've got two kind of distinct clusters here. AI can do that too. It's called a clustering algorithm. Uh, computer vision is another good application for um, unsupervised um, machine learning. Okay, so what is supervised machine learning? What, what, what is ChatGPT doing? Uh, how do we make predictions as, as people? How do we get a human-like output? So this is some famous data. This is Galileo. He went to different floors of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, dropped a cannonball out, measured the time it took to hit the ground. Uh, but he skipped some floors. So how do we go back and we predict the time it would take for those floors that he skipped? Well, we could do a linear equation, y equals mx plus b, two parameters, m and b. Uh, and that can give us a pretty good approximation. Uh, if we want better, we could go to three parameters, y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. Now we've got a really good prediction engine. So how many parameters would it take to model the English language and guess the next words to the sentence? The best thing about AI is its ability to blank. How many parameters would it take to model all this and give you a human-like response to the system. Well, ChatGPT3 has about 175 billion parameters. So one, two, 175 billion parameters. Uh, ChatGPT2 had 1.5 billion parameters and no one heard about that, so that wasn't enough. So somewhere between those two is what it takes to give you a, 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 a real human-like response to text input. Um, so, ChatGPT is essentially just a huge equation that might look something like this, uh, except for it's got a 175 billion parameters on it. 
Now, for quadratic equations, for linear equations, there's just numerical methods that you can follow to get the precise value of every parameter. You're not gonna be able to do that with 175 billion parameters. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna feed it data of what you want it to look like and you're gonna make adjustments to those parameters. So GPT-1, 4.8 gigabytes of data. GPT-2, 40 gigabytes of data. GPT-3, 570 gigabytes of data. And so with this, with machine learning, with AI, the amount of parameters and the amount of data you need to start to get a human-like response is more of an art than a science. No one knows how much it's gonna take given the complexity of the problem. So OpenAI fully expected, you know, 1.75 billion parameters and 40 gigs of data to work. It didn't work. So they had to keep increasing um, until they got a, a good solution. So <laughs> notice that none of this, notice that we didn't say, what's the next word that makes this sentence accurate? What's the next word that makes this sentence true? It's just what is the most probable next word that it's gonna be. So you get these halluc hallucination problems in these, and people call them hallucination problems, I just call them lying. Um, Chatbots will, will lie to you. Uh, and it's, for me it's very frustrating for me because normally when somebody doesn't know the answer or they're lying to you, you kind of get a sense of that. Uh, but the chatbot is perfect, eloquent sentence that is a total falsity. So it kind of messes with your human brain that's used to understanding uh, lies and disinformation. So here's a great quote from uh, Rodney Books. What the large language models are good at is saying what an answer should sound like, which is different than an an what an answer should be. So that's really what it's gonna give you. It's gonna give you what the answer should sound like, and it's gonna do a perfect job of that. It's an excellent writer. It was trained on a lot of text. Um, so you can help that. You could use, it's a great writer, um, you could use that in your design practice. Helpful prompts. Rephrase this technical report for a non-technical technical audience. It can do that really quickly, uh, help you, uh, you know, take the same report, use it multiple times. Write an abstract for this report. Explain this architectural concept to me. Uh, make this email or RFI response sound more polite, professional. I don't know if you guys have ever had an angry RFI response. So I was always told, you know, sit on it for a day, rewrite it after you've calmed down. So it would take a day, delay in the RFI response. ChatGPT, that's a whole other day to they, they get it back. You know, they could get the response very quickly. And I don't sound like an asshole. <laughs> but that, none of this really helps you in design. None of this is designing a building. So uh, what, do we, what do we actually want? So AI takes input data and gives you an output. ChatGPT takes a text question, gives you a text answer. We want what I'm gonna call hypothetically HVAC GPT, which takes an architectural model and outputs an HVAC model. How would we build this? Um, so let's go back and let's talk about parameters and data a little bit. So zero to nine digit optical character recognition, it's about 2,000 parameters. It takes handwritten digits, turns it into machine readable digits, it's about 2,000 parameters. Dog or cat, 60,000 parameters. Uh, large language model, 175 billion parameters. How many parameters would HVAC design take? Who knows, how much data would it take? We don't know. Um, let's talk about where we could get training data for HVAC design. So. ChatGPT used uh, 575 gigabytes of text, three billion words. Now let's think about that data. Everything about text is in the text. I don't need to know that it's English language. I don't need to know uh, anything additional, any metadata about that text. It's about the text. And data integrity, it wasn't trained on somebody's notes or somebody's uncompleted story. It was all trained on data that was intended to be consumed and read by humans. So you had very good data integrity. So let's compare that to our hypothetical HVAC GPT. Uh, where could we get HVAC designs from? Large MEP firms probably have thousands of, of MEP designs. Uh, Autodesk probably has access to maybe 
tens of thousands of HVAC designs. Uh, government, when you submit your plans to a government, it becomes kind of open knowledge. You can request those and uh, you know, you can go around to every AHJ and get every design that's ever been submitted, run those through a model, and uh, you know, have a lot of data for HVAC design. Is it enough? We don't know. Uh, let's talk about the data completeness. Uh, plans are diagrammatic in nature. The plan might not take, might not be what it actually takes to build or design the system. The location matters. The same building in Miami might be different in Minnesota. If you put the same building into your uh, model and you have two conflicting designs, how bad does that mess your model up? Uh, how much additional data would you need to account for that mess up? What do utilities are available? If natural gas isn't available, again, you might get two different designs. Uh, and then the de data integrity. You've got errors and omissions in these designs. Uh, what is a good design, what is a bad design? If you give two engineers the same building, they're probably not gonna come up with the same design. Wh how bad does that mess with your model? So, and, and no one knows, but my gut is, for these reasons, we're not gonna get an HVAC GPT. Um, now, there, I'm sure people are going to try. I'm sure people are getting funded right now that are going through and doing this. I don't think they'll be successful. I might be wrong. So how do we, if we can't do an HVAC G, GPT, how are we going to apply AI to HVAC design? Well, the first thing to recognize is that BIM adds data context to HVAC design. So before BIM, you're dealing with hand drawings, you're dealing with CAD drawings. These are very data poor. Uh, all the information you have about this is that it's a line. So if you're de dealing with 2D drawings, to even get off the ground, you have to have an AI interpreter to understand that this is brick, this is insulation. Uh, it's uh, very, very hard. Now BIM is a total game changer. Now I don't need, I don't need a AI algorithm to identify windows. It's in the model as a window element. Um, and of course, uh, CAD is losing popularity, BIM gaining popularity. So. AI, uh, as BIM t takes over, AI has, is much more applicable just because of the amount of data and the um, structure of the data. So here's some helpful examples of AI that we can use in HVAC design. So space type assignment, zoning, diffuser layout, uses combined of machine learning and expert systems. Um, so not, with HVAC design, not all the data we have is bad. So we can't just take the whole design, shove it in a model, and hope to get a good output. But can we narrow down and identify data that can be helpful? Space type assignments is a great one. Your firm probably, every building you design, you go through and there's hundreds of spaces that you assign an ASHRAE 62.1 space type to. That is a perfect application for a large language model. It's, it's words, it's area, and it's dog or cat. It's either a conference room or an office. It's, there's no um, argument there. So, and you have lots of it. You have lots of data, uh, probably sitting in a spreadsheet somewhere. So, uh, perfect application for a log layers. It knows that an admin uh, that's 165 square feet is an office space. Um, it's a great application. So this takes about 20,000 parameters and about 60,000 spaces and you could have a great large language model, automatically takes uh, architectural room name and gets the ASHRAE 62.1 space type. Um, and this also, you know the space type actually obviously has ventilation data associated with it, but you can associate all kinds of data with space type, thermostat types, um, default internal loads, just, you could just add more and more data to this that helps your further uh, AI applications. Um, expert systems, but computer, computer vision for diffuser layout. So I wrote the expert system uh, for a diffuser layout algorithm in December 2022 of the ASHRAE Journal. Did anybody read that? Um, 
Go back and read it. <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't write that as a, a, as a flow diagram. I wrote it as pseudocode. So there's pseudocode in there about a diffuser layout algorithm, an expert system for laying out d diffuser systems. Now this by itself is okay. I mean, it, it, it's, it could be helpful. Um, normally, you just kind of look at a room and you know how to lay the diffusers out. So why would you do this? Well, because now BIM is adding data context to my design. Now I know what the space looks like. Now I could apply this to the space if I apply uh, com computer vision or, or a, um, or a uh, uh, clustering algorithm. Same thing goes for zoning. Zoning is basically just a clustering algorithm. Now, it's not you just can't pull the code off Google and say, zone my building. You've got to give it some a little bit more context, a little bit more knowledge. So the expert system knows that, hey, don't, don't cluster the class two space ca cafeteria along with the uh, conference room. Um, so instead of just feeding a million HVAC designs into HVAC GPT, break the problem down and apply the correct uh, solution to each problem. Now, if we do this, so we can't do this, we can't do, well, I don't think we can do this, uh, HVAC GPT. So if we do enough of these specialized tasks, do we get a, if we sum all of these tasks out, do we get a 10x engineer? Um, I don't know. Um, but I'd like to find out. Um, when you think about what you actually do, even if we did have an HVAC GPT and you just hit the button and a, a perfect HVAC design came out, how much of your job is that actually? Probably less than half. A lot of your job consists of explaining concepts to owners, talking to architects, um, responding to emails, getting things built. Uh, it, it's, it's unclear that even if we do this perfectly that we're gonna get the 10X engineer. We need different communication systems, different construction processes. Um, a lot of things are gonna have to change, I think, to get here, but uh, I think it's a journey worth taking. And any, any questions? And if anything comes up, feel free to email me. Uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. I post great HVAC memes. Probably the only person you're gonna find that does that. <laughs>